All right, well, here in Lamentations chapter 3, this poem is uh, going to be different. This is Jeremiah basically speaking in behalf of Judah, um, you know, ba- like praying to God for deliverance, for overcoming the challenges and problems that they're facing. So this is going to be more of Jeremiah, like a conversation in prayer of Jeremiah with God, basically. Uh, now, in uh, Guthrie and Moiter's, uh, Moiter's New Bible Commentary, they made a comment about this chapter, too. They said, in true prophetic vein, the elegist puts himself alongside his countrymen and entreats them to return to the Lord and to seek reconciliation with him. Let them examine themselves in the light of his commandments, which they have transgressed, and let the lifting up of their hands to God in heaven be accompanied by the lifting up of their hearts also i.e., let their prayers for pardon be true and sincere. Let them know, too, what it feels like to be unpardoned, to be under God's judgment still, and they will come to appreciate all the more the wonder of his forgiveness. So some fun stuff we get to see in this chapter today. So let's get started. Verse 1, I am the man that has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He hath led me and brought me into darkness, but not into light. Surely against me is he turned. He turneth his hand against me all the day. My flesh and my skin hath he made old. He hath broken my bones. He hath builded against me and compassed me with gall and travail. He hath set me in dark places as as they that be dead of old. He hath hedged me about that I cannot get out. He hath made my chain heavy. Also, when I cry and shout, he shutteth up my prayer. He hath enclosed my ways with hewn stone. He hath made my path crooked. He was unto me as a bear lying in wait and as a lion in secret places. He hath turned aside my ways and pulled me in pieces. He hath made me desolate. He hath bent his bow and set me as a mark for the arrow. So this is like, this is how bad Jerusalem and Judah would feel. Like God is totally against me here. This is how they're feeling basically. Uh, In fact, verse 13, he hath caused the arrows of his quiver to enter into my reins. Now what he's talking about in that part there is the reins are your vital organs. So you're getting shot in the abdominal area, basically, with arrows. Um, Verse 14, I was a derision to all my people and their song all the day. He hath filled me with bitterness. He hath made me drunken with wormwood. Wormwood's not a very pleasant uh, plant to drink, basically kind of a, a poison. Uh, 16, he hath also broken my teeth with gravel stones. He hath covered me with ashes. So think about this, is people are eating rocks. They're trying to eat whatever they can. They're starving to death, basically. Covered me with ashes. Now this is interesting. This could be forced to be humble. God is covering us with ashes. He's forcing us to be, you know, pour ashes on ourselves to be humble. Um, But it could be also kind of a symbology of the city burning down. All the ash that was put kicked up because of the burning of the city down, kind of an idea as well. So we can kind of see that one two ways. Uh, verse 17, And thou hast removed my soul far off from peace. I forget prosperity. Now the, the NRSV version, which is so, if you're not familiar, the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible is basically another English translation of the Bible. What they did is they went back to a lot of the Greek translations uh, because the Masoretic text was a little more Latin translations, Vulgate things. So they're going back to more ancient, uh, older documents as best as they can find and re-going through the Bible to try to see, can we improve how the Bible reads? And so the NRSV is a result of that, basically. Uh, So sometimes these verses make more sense from the NRSV. And this is, verse 17 is one of them. Uh, So instead of saying, I forgot prosperity, the NRSV says, I have forgotten what happiness is. So the destruction has been so bad, it has been so long, that they've forgotten how to be happy. They've forgotten what it's like to have a good day. That's that's bad. That's pretty bad. 
Uh, verse 18, and I said, my strength and my hope is perished from the Lord. Remembering mine affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall, my soul hath them still in remembrance and is humbled in me. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. So they're still remembering all the problems that happened, but they haven't forgotten that God is there and that he has made promises to help them at some point. Verse 22, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. So they're realizing we're not completely extinct. So God has helped us a little bit in this. We're still, there's still some of us alive. We're still here. Uh, we still have a chance to continue forward, basically. Uh, verse 23, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Those three verses are great. Some really good insight we can get in there. Uh, realizing, of course, hoping in God sometimes requires patience. Patience through our trials, patience to overcome things. God doesn't just immediately solve all of our problems for us. He's not a helicopter parent or a wheelbarrow parent. He doesn't do that. As much as we probably wish he would, he doesn't. He helps us as we offer faith and patience on him. Sometimes that patience is the test of our faith. Things don't happen immediately because God's going, are you really sure you've got the faith to do this? To let me help you? And so those that wait for him, those that quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord, that have hope in him, are the ones that he can help the most and work with. Um, verse 27 now, it is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. That makes sense. Anybody that's older than 35 realizes that if you're going to have hard times, having them in your teens and 20s is much easier than having them later on in life. Uh, verse 28, he sitteth alone and keepeth silence because he hath borne it upon him. He putteth his mouth in the dust. If so be, there may be hope. Now this is kind of the idea of God causes us to be humble so he can help us learn how to be better. Kind of think of the idea of the bee that we've talked about in the past, the symbol of going from death to life. God takes us from a bad state to a good state. And that's what he's talking about here. There is hope if we rely on God to help us. We're not getting out of this ourselves. God can help us out of this. And that's a good, important lesson for us to learn. Uh, verse 30, he giveth his cheek to him that smiteth him. He is filled full with reproach. The Lord will not cast off forever. But though he cause grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. For he doth not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men, to crush under his feet all the prisoners of the earth, to turn aside the right man, right of a man before the face of the Most High, to subvert a man in his cause, the Lord approveth not. So his, the, the thing is, realize, God doesn't just willy-nilly punish us. That's what they're talking about here, basically, is he doesn't just do this because he likes it. He doesn't afflict us and cause us pain because he likes us. He loves us, and he wants the best for us. But he knows sometimes that means we have to learn on our own. We have to go through problems and challenges to change our minds to help us to think better so we can be better. Sometimes that hard work and suffering helps us to be better. You know, a calm sea never made a good sailor. So that's this concept and idea. God is lovingly helping us learn through our pain. Not trying to save us from our pain, but learn through it to be better. The more we have, and you, you have to admit this in your life, if you've ever had a time in your life where you felt lots of pain and sorrow, you have empathy and you have the ability to help people in ways that someone who's never been through that can't quite grasp. Because you've been there, you have the ability to help others. So that's taking your pain and suffering and turning it into a blessing and benefit for you and others. So that's kind of this idea. So this is, Jeremiah is really hoping, and, and what God wants to do, of course, as we learned in the book of Jeremiah, is use this to change Israel, to want 
to follow him again. That's the point of the exile. You're going to feel pain because you've, you've made bad choices. And through this pain, I will be able to help you again. That's, that's what God wants to do, basically. Uh, verse 37, So is, who is he that saith, and it cometh to pass, when the Lord commandeth it not? So that's like somebody saying, I'm going to speak for God when God didn't speak. Kind of a false prophet idea. Uh, verse 38, Out of the mouth of the Most High proceedeth not evil and good. Wherefore doth a living man complain, a man for the punishment of his sins? Let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord. Let us lift up our heart with our hands unto God in the heavens. We have transgressed and have rebelled. Thou hast not pardoned. Thou hast covered with anger and persecuted us. Thou hast slain and thou hast not pitied. Thou hast covered thyself with a cloud that our prayer should not pass through. So what's what's happening here is they're saying basically, let's not listen to the false people who aren't representing God. Let's go to God ourselves. Let's learn and gain the, the forgiveness from him. But realize if we're going to go to God and do these things, we have to do it with full purpose of heart. If we don't approach God with full purpose of heart, it's not going to work. We have to admit it. And, and so they're saying, we want to pray to God, but it feels like we're not getting through. It feels like, like in verse 43, thou hast covered with anger and persecuted us. Thou, in verse 44, thou hast covered thyself with a cloud that our prayer should not pass through. So they're, they're, it, it takes time. You know, they took, they took their time returning to God. So God's kind of taking his time returning to them. Uh, verse 45, thou hast made us as the off-scouring and refuse in the midst of the people. All our enemies have opened their mouths against us. Fear and a snare is come upon us, desolation and destruction. Mine eye runneth down with rivers of water for the destruction of the daughter of my people. So this is crying, sadness, mourning for them. So again, the people wanted to be saved from the destruction, but they didn't want to repent. And that's not what God's about. If they truly repent, God can then help them. But he can't save them from the inevitable consequence of their choices. That would be going against the laws of heaven, basically. Uh, let's see. Uh, verse 49. Mine eye trickleth down and ceaseth not without any intermission. Till the Lord look down and behold from heaven, mine eye affected mine heart because of all the daughters of mine city. Mine enemies chased me sore like a bird without cause. Now, 52 is interesting. So this is, we're kind of talking about how, how they're in mourning. They're sad. They, they want God to help them. Their emotions, they are just distraught, really depressed and, and down because of their destructions, basically. Um, now, verse 52, could this be poetry about the people catching Jeremiah? This is interesting. Mine enemies chase me sore like a bird without cause. Uh, and then verse 53, it goes on about this. But this, this is interesting because if you remember the story about Jeremiah, remember he went to before the, the Zedekiah and the, the princes, the princes said, we need to kill Zedekiah and get him out of the way because he's preaching against us. And Zedekiah wouldn't do it. Zedekiah's like, fine, you do whatever you want. I'm not going to be a part of it. So they said, well, we can't really kill him because we don't, we can't really like have a law to justify it. So let's just do this. We're going to throw him in a, in a well, and we're going to hope he dies naturally, basically. That's, when you look at these, it's really interesting because maybe, maybe there's some symbology or some ideas coming to Jeremiah as we read this. So verse 53, They have cut off my life in the dungeon and cast a stone upon me. Waters flowed over mine head. Then I said, I am cut off. I called upon thy name, O Lord, out of the low dungeon. Thou hast heard my voice. Hide not thine ear at my breathing, at my cry. Thou drewest near in the day that I called upon thee, and saidest, Fear not. O Lord, thou hast ple pleaded the causes of my soul, and hast redeemed my life. O Lord, thou hast seen my wrong. Judge thou my cause. Thou hast seen all their vengeance and all their imaginations against me. Thou hast heard their reproach, O Lord, and all their imaginations against me. The lips of those that rose up against me and their device against me all the day. Behold, they're sitting down and they're rising up. I am their music. Render unto them a recompense, O Lord, according to the work of their hands. Give them sorrow of heart, and thy curse unto them. 
persecute and destroy them in anger from under the heavens of the Lord. So this, this last section here could be a, a kind of like a Jeremiah ad. Like this is Jeremiah thinking about, man, when he was in that dungeon, it's filling up with water. It's his cistern. It's as well. He's stuck in the mud, but the water's coming up above his head. So which means he's drowning. And but because he's he could be there could be waters rising, it could be him sinking in the mud. He's drowning and he's pleading with God to help him. God brings him some peace and says, I will take care of you. You're okay. And remember, the Ethiopian uh, tells the Zedekiah, Hey, they just threw Jeremiah in a well and covered him with a rock. And Zedekiah's like, Oh, we can't have him die. This isn't going to be good. If he dies, he's the, he's the prophet of God. If he dies, we're going to be in worse trouble. Go get him out. Get a bunch of men. Get him out of there. And he was freed from that dungeon and was not put back there. Uh, if you look in the, again in the book of Jeremiah, we go over that story more. Uh, so let's jump over to the next poem and to learn more about what Jeremiah is thinking about this destruction of Jerusalem.